the aim at BMW has always been to design transducers that accurately reproduce the signal. It's really quite easy to create a sound, but it's much more, much more difficult to reproduce accurately a signal. Now, this aim translates in tweeters to creating a device that moves as a rigid piston over the frequency range required, which is really the audible range, which is the range from range below 20 kilohertz. Now, as you go up in frequency, a point is reached where the speaker ceases to behave in a nice controlled way and it starts to resonate. Um, now, the frequency at which this occurred is, occurs is usually called the breakup frequency. As you go beyond the breakup frequency, more and more resonances uh, are encountered. Now, the problem with resonance is that it really imparts a character to the speaker, which obviously then is not consistent with our aim of accurately reproducing uh, a signal. So BMW have, for a long time, used aluminium dome tweeters. Aluminium is a really good material to use. It's relatively light and stiff, um, and really it results in a, in a relatively high breakup frequency. Over the years, we've managed to sort of to optimise the mechanical design, and we've improved the breakup frequency from about 23 kilohertz to 30 kilohertz, uh, as in the 800 series two. Um, we found that with each improvement in breakup frequency, uh, the resulting tweeter sounded much cleaner. Now we found this really curious because, as I already said, you can only really hear up to 20 kilohertz. What what difference does it make if you improve a breakup frequency from 23 to 30 kilohertz? So we started to wonder uh, why this was, uh, and really uh, about ways that we could improve the breakup frequency much further. Now the easiest way to improve the breakup frequency is to make the speaker or make the tweeter much smaller. Uh, now the problem with that is that really to get the same output over the same bandwidth, you have to drive the speaker a lot harder. Uh, you the dome has to move a lot more. Uh, and if it moves a lot more, you potentially run into problems with linearity and the resulting distortion. Uh, and also uh, if you drive it harder, uh, you can run into problems with power compression. An alternative approach might be to use a supplementary tweeter in addition to your main tweeter. Now we did consider this, it does complicate the situation. You have to remember that our aim is really to produce a, a tweeter that has no audible coloration below 20 kilohertz. By using a supplementary tweeter, we couldn't really see how, that we, how we could compensate for the, uh, the deficiencies of a main tweeter. It's just adding something more. Final problem with um, uh, using an additional tweeter is uh, the possible interference effects that you can get between it and the, and the main tweeter. So really, we, we thought about it for a while, but really it didn't seem c consistent with our approach of keeping things simple uh, and of accurately reproducing a sound. It only really added more complications uh, to the situation. Now, finite element analysis is a tool that's widely used in a lot of industries, but in particular the aerospace and automotive industries. Really, the aim is to create virtual computer prototypes on which it's quite easy to carry out experiments before committing to sort of real physical prototypes. So, by using finite element analysis, we're able to look at how a structure vibrates in detail, the acoustic field that results from the vibration, uh, and as an aside, we're also able to uh, look at the, the, the motor systems in loudspeakers. We're able to uh, optimise the sensitivity, uh, to improve the linearity, uh, and to, uh, to, to design the shielding uh, that's appropriate for a system. Now, using finite element analysis, we first simulated the response of a perfect rigid tweeter made of an infinitely stiff material, which of course doesn't exist in reality, and this is another beauty of finite element analysis, you can do things that you can't do in the real world. So we started to look at alternative materials that we could use instead of the aluminium. And there's quite a few materials that you could use, but the ultimate material to use uh, from a rigidity, a, a kind of dynamic stiffness point of view, is diamond. Uh, by using diamond, we were able to create a tweeter that breaks up at 70 kilohertz compared with a, a value of 30 kilohertz with the standard aluminium domes. What this means is that when you compare the response of the diamond tweeter with the perfect hypothetical rigid tweeter, the, the responses are very similar below 20 kilohertz. So we think there's a dramatic improvement, in, there's a dramatic improvement in performance that results. Well, meet Kevlar cones. 
B&W were pioneers in so-called woven fibre cones and the best material for this is Kevlar. Now Kevlar has good internal damping and it allows just the right amount of resin to be added so it makes it not totally stiff. Metal cones and cones with too much resin are very stiff and consequently they ring like bells. Kevlar allows just the right, right kind of controlled breakup to occur. Now coal controlled breakup allows a central radiating area to smoothly reduce in size at just the right rate and it also adds the, allows the outer regions to smoothly cancel out as you go to higher and higher frequencies. This is a consequence of so-called fourfold symmetry. We'll get onto that more later. But first let's look at what ordinary plastic cones do. Now on this demonstration we see um, an impulse being fed into the voice coil of a plastic cone and we see a fast impulse moving to the surround followed by slower impulses which get reflected from the surround just like a sea wave being reflected off a sea wall. Now every time you can get a whole number of half wavelengths of the sound fitting in between the voice coil and the chassis we get what is known as a standing wave otherwise known as a resonance occurring which gives a peak and a dip in the response and because plastic cones are totally symmetrical all the way around there's no possibility of cancellation and the resulting resonances are highly audible. Now let's have a look at the way Kevlar behaves in comparison. What we see here is an impulse going into a Kevlar cone and the first few frames of this show that this, the wave speed is different in different directions. In fact I need my hands to explain this. With a Kevlar cone you've got woven fibres which are warp, weft and bias directions and it's actually stiffer in the bias direction and if you've got just the right amount of um, resin in, it's exactly the right amount of increased stiffness in the bias direction which allows the resonances in that direction to cancel out the resonances in the other direction. Another way of looking at that is to use this kind of a plot where each of these pictures is a, con is a scan across the whole of the uh, speaker cone. The top one shows a um, plastic cone with a um, rolled surround and the bottom one is our new FST surroundless Kevlar and we see that even at, the, at this lowest frequency of this uh, plot the um, floppy surround has a problem. It looks like the surround is moving too much. The Kevlar of course with its FST surround has no problem at all, it's moving as a perfect piston. And what's happening with the top cone is that we get exactly a quarter of a wavelength between the voice coil and the chassis and because the uh, surround is much floppier than the cone the surround is taking up most of the movement. As we go through this demonstration we see that uh, what used to be called the first surround resonance is where we can fit in exactly a whole wavelength between the voice coil and the chassis and once again because the uh, surround is the floppiest bit it's taking up most of the movement and the cone is hardly moving at all. As we go up to higher and higher frequencies we see in the plastic cone the behaviour which, which used to be called um, cone breakup. Now we've moved into the so-called mass controlled region where it doesn't matter how floppy the various bits are, only how massive they are. And the cone and the surround are similarly massive here, so you can't see where the cone ends and the surround begins. And we see every time we can get um, an exact number of half wavelengths fitting in to this distance between the voice coil and the chassis, we get a resonance occurring which colours the sound and affects the response curve. Looking at the lower picture, as we go to higher and higher frequencies, we see the characteristic square behaviour of woven fibre Kevlar cones. We get a central square radiating area which reduces in size, and outside that region is a fourfold symmetrical region where we get regions going up and regions going down, and they cancel out in the near field. Now, particularly at 4 kHz, the central radiating area has gone down to half, and at 6 kHz, the central radiating area has gone down to a quarter. So moving on then from mid-range units with its reducing area source we move on to base units with their totally different set of requirements. Now base units have to shift a lot of air so they have to be big and they have to move a lot. They have to be very stiff so they don't bend while they're shifting the air. They have to have exactly the right mass for the sensitivity of the drive unit and to define the low frequency roll-off of the entire system. They have to be well damped so if they do ring at higher frequencies it gets absorbed very quickly and they finally have to stop any sound inside the box from coming through the cone into the outside world because that sort of thing is highly audible. So how do we achieve that? Well here's the Rohacell solution. Rohacell is a, um, a lightly foamed material which is incredibly light. 
it's also quite stiff and well damped. It allows us therefore to put some very stiff skins on the outside of the thick Rohacell filling which utilises the I-beam principle to make a lot of stiffness. Because there's a lot of internal damping we see from these pictures that the impulses measured at the voice coil and the surround are incredibly well damped. Compare the impulses in the rower cell, which is the uh, nice smooth curve, with the paper, which is the one with a lot of wobbles on it. We see that the rower cell solution really works there. If we look at an individual animated frequency now, just outside the operating band, once again the rower cell moving up and down smoothly is bending a great deal less than the equivalent paper cone at that frequency, which is outside the operating band. Finally, let's have a look at the uh, measurements of transmission loss with rower cell. We see from this picture that the transmission loss in the rower cell cone, with its two skins and absorbing filling, is about 10 dB better than the equivalent paper. So that's 10 dB less interfering sound coming from the inside of the box to the outside of the box. We get an additional effect in base units from our mushroom construction. And this is like a matrix, if you like, for cones. It adds a certain stiffness because it's connected in various directions, just like the matrix occurs inside the box. It stiffens up the cone. So for real speakers in real environments, we must select the best compromise possible from all the things that are available in our armoury. And in, our, in the present case, it's a piston-like low frequency, very stiff driver, a piston-like high frequency um, tweeter, which goes up to incredibly high frequencies, and a reducing area source for the middle driver, utilising our FST, or surroundless Kevlar technology.